uh, scripture as Ecclesiastes 4 we won't read that for a while I have, I have quite a bit of verbiage here uh, title of this sermonette if you wish to title it is what does God want of us what does God require of us Many people say, only believe. That's all God requires, just believe. But many who will say that will go on and talk about a special or individual plan that God has for each individual's life. Does God have a special individual plan for me, for Carl, for Jesse, for Vicki? Does he have an individual plan? Before I get into a scripture, I'm going to just use a little common sense. Jesus Christ is going to return to this earth and set up the government of God, and he will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. What happens when we have a new president in the United States? Or what happens when there's a coup and there's a new ruler in some country? What do they do first? They place their friends in places of authority, in offices of authority, so that those uh, policies that this individual has, whether he be president, prime minister, king, or dictator, he wants his agenda to be followed. So he puts his friends in place. Is God any less intelligent? Is God any less intelligent? And when Jesus Christ returns to this earth, will he not put his friends in charge of his agenda? Now let's read uh, Ephesians verse, or chapter 4, and I want verse 8, and then 11 and 12. Okay, verse 8. Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up, speaking of Christ, on high, he, Jesus Christ, led captive, or captivity captive, and he gave gifts unto men. Down to verse 11. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Verse 12. For the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's not up to a person to take upon himself any of these gifts that God gives because God is in control. Jesus Christ is control, in, in, in control of his church. He is the master. We are the, the flock. We are to follow his directive. That's right now in the church of God. What about when Christ returns and sets up the kingdom of God? Let's turn to Revelation chapter 5, and I'll read verses 9 and 10. Revelation 5, 9 and 10. Speaking about uh, people who, uh, at, at the last of the uh, verse 8, you can see is talking about prayers of saints. And they sang a new song, verse 9, saying, You are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for you were slain and were redeemed and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And what will the, these people who are redeemed be doing in the kingdom of God? They're friends of Jesus Christ. He's redeemed, he's redeemed them. Verse 10 and you have made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So Jesus Christ is intelligent enough as any dictator or president or ruler of men to know what he must do for his agenda, the law of God, to be promoted. But what, how can we qualify? How can we qualify for the position that we're offered, kings and priests? How can we qualify? It has much to do with our heart, more to do with our heart and our intent 
the desire of our heart and our mind than anything else. Turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 10. And I want verse 16. Through Moses, God told the children of Israel, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. What does it mean to circumcise the foreskin of your heart? Paul tells us, and we'll get to that. But now let's go over to uh, chapter 30 of Deuteronomy. And I'll show you that God will circumcise hearts that won't perhaps willingly do it. He's calling people now, and it's a free will thing. We are called, and we can make a choice. We can circumcise our hearts, or we can be stiff-necked as Israel was. But there's coming a time, and we we'll want to read verse 6 to identify that. There's coming a time when God will circumcise people's hearts. Verse 6, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, so you may live. God wants us to love him with our total being. Anything less than that is not pleasing with God. And it's considered a circumcision of the fleshly heart. Okay? Our flesh leads us into ways that are not good for us. And when we understand those ways are not good for us and we cut them out of our life, it's circumcising the heart. So who does God deal with. Turn to Isaiah 66. Right now, God is dealing with people on a voluntary basis, as I said. He is not forcefully circumcising anyone's heart. But who does he work with? I want verse 2. And I'm not going to read the whole thing. Because at the last of that verse, it's talking about those who are poor and of a contrite spirit and who tremble at God's word. Those are the people who God is dealing with. Hopefully, we all tremble at the power of God's word. It is said in Hebrews that it is sharper than a two-edged sword, cutting asunder to the bone, discerning the thoughts of of the mind. And it's the thoughts of the mind, the desires of the heart, the desires of the flesh, which we need to get rid of. Let's turn to Acts chapter 7, and we'll see for sure from the Word of God that Israel did not circumcise their hearts, even though God requested that they do so. I want verse 51. Uh, Acts Verse, chapter 7, 51. <clears throat> and this is Paul here speaking to a bunch of Israelites. He says, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart. Now, they were circumcised in the flesh, but they didn't circumcise their heart. And you, they were uncircumcised in ears, and you do always resist the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, as I, I prefer to say. As your fathers did, so do you. So God, through uh, Paul, turned to the Gentiles. Let's go back to the book of Ephesians, and we'll see that. Ephesians chapter 2, I want verses uh, 11 and through 13. And it's talking about Christ again. And then, in whom also you have obtained an inheritance, being, uh, I'm reading verse 11, being predestined according to the, I'm in, I'm in chapter 1, I'm, I apologize. I want chapter 2, verse 11. Uh, and wherefore, remember that you, being in times past Gentiles in the flesh, that means uncircumcised, who are called uncircumcised by those who are called the circumcision. The Jews called the Gentiles uncircumcised, and well, they were. But the Jews 
had only the circumcision that was made by hands. They did not circumcise their heart. They were not willing to allow God to direct them. We need to be willing to allow God to direct our path. We need to circumcise our heart. Verse 12. That at times you were without Christ, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, Gentiles, verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So God is calling Gentiles who will be willing to circumcise their heart. Paul tells us in, I'm just going to refer, well, no, I do want to read it. Let's go back to Romans chapter 2, and I'm going to read these quickly. Verse 29, Paul tells the uh, Gentiles who were in the Roman church, verse 29, he says, He is a Jew which is one inwardly and Circumcision is that of, guess what? The heart in the spirit and not in the letter or in the flesh. God wants us to circumcise our hearts. Go back to Ephesians chapter 6. And I want verse 6. Ephesians 6, 6. And he's talking about servants being obedient to their masters. And we'll just catch part of it here in uh, verse 5. He wants uh, people to serve their masters in singleness of heart. God is interested in your heart, in my heart, in our heart. He's not as much interested in our actions as he is our hearts because if our hearts are right, it's going to lead us in good action. Okay? Now verse 6. Not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Your heart is important to God. God looks on the heart. Philippians, just a page or two over from Ephesians. Or Philippians 3, 3. For we, as in th- these Philippians are uh, themselves Gentiles, so he says, we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit or in the heart and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Paul taught people that they didn't need to, Gentiles, they didn't need to circumcise themselves physically. He said circumcise your heart. Uh, Turn over a little bit further to Colossians 2, verse 11. Colossians 2, 11. In whom also ye, and speaking again of of Christ, speaking of Jesus Christ, so in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcised circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of sins. That's what circumcision of the heart is, putting off sin, getting sin out of your life, recognizing sin and avoiding it as best you can. Paul told us in the seventh chapter of Romans, that would be my last scripture, seventh chapter of Romans, how, he told us how to circumcise our hearts. I'm going to read uh, a few verses, I'm not going to read them all, but here in verse 12, he says the law, verse 12 of Romans 7, the, the law is holy and the commandment is holy and just and good. Then down in verse 14, he says, the law is spiritual, but he identifies the problem. He says, I am carnal, sold under sin. Then verses 15 through down to 22, you can read how Paul said, I cannot do, and he didn't want to be redundant. So he didn't say, I can't do the holy, just, 
good commandments of God, but that's why he called the commandments holy, just, and good. He just shortened it to good. He said, I can't do the good commandments of God. I, can, I do evil. I don't know what evil Paul did, but I'm sure he had some habits he didn't like. But we all are creatures of habit. We all have habits we don't like. But we need to be purging those out of our life, cutting them from our heart, from our, our life. How do you love God and circumcise your heart? Verse 22, Paul says, I delight in the holy, just, and good commandments of God. That's what he called the law, holy, just, and good. So we'll be redundant here. For I delight in the holy, just, and good law of God after the inward man. That's the heart. I want verse 25 now. So then, with the mind where do, wherein dwells intent, purpose, desire, the mind wherein lies effort. If your mind is not in it, you're not going to put any effort in it. So your mind is the seat of effort. And we must put effort in obeying God's law. In our mind, we must be pure. While in our life, Paul says, but with the flesh, I serve, Paul says, the law of sin. He committed sin from time to time. He didn't practice sin. It caught him off guard, as it were. He had habits that were hard to break. We all do, okay? But in your mind and in your heart is where God is looking. What does that do? When you love God's law and you obey it in your mind, verse 1 of chapter 8, therefore, because of what he just said, I obey God's law in my mind and I, in my physical life, I mess up. Therefore, for that reason, there is no condemnation. And you know, my last sermon that dealt with the combination, condemnation of God's law. That's why God gave it. It condemns the sinner by saying, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Remember the Sabbath day. Don't forget it. Honor your parents. Don't dishonor them. The law of God condemns sin and the sinner. But those who love God's law in their heart and obey it with their intent, with their desire, are not under the condemnation of the law. And he adds this stipulation, which backs up what I've just said. Those who walk not after the flesh of willful or negligent sin, but who walk after the spirit of loving God's law and obeying it in the mind and heart. The sermonette fit in very well, as if it was inspired. Uh, sorry I missed that last little part of it. I was worried about running out of tape. But anyway, that was a, that was a really timely uh, sermonette message. And the title of this message is, Men do not naturally understand the mature, higher love of God. And at the end, we're going to focus on Galatians 4, 8 through 10, one of the most misunderstood verses in the Bible. So what does God require of us? As I say, the sermon that fits perfectly. God requires us to love him with all our heart at a higher level. And we're going to, uh, obviously the topic is very deep. So we can't cover all the scriptures today, but we'll cover some of them and then we can discuss it more in Bible study if, as we need to. Let's go to Matthew 12, Matthew 12, 29. And by the way, the, uh, a young man asked Christ, you know, and others, what is the greatest commandment in, the, in that sort of question? And here's the answer that Christ gave. Matthew 12, verse 29. Um, uh -oh. <clears throat> um, well, actually, 12.29 is, is something different. We'll get to that other one in a minute. 12.29, uh, actually 11.29 is what I want to go to. And we'll, we'll pick it up 
in verse 28, 11, 28. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The reason he said that was because the leaders of Judaism had put heavy yokes on the people. And Judaism, as they were practicing it, hard on the people, very hard on the people. So <clears throat> when Christ was asked the question about the law, what he said was to love God with all your heart and all your mind, which we've heard the scripture from Leviticus that Christ was quoting, and the, the first four commandments tell you how to love God the Father you know, and God the Son with all your heart and all your mind. And the last six tell you how to love mankind with all your heart. And, and what I believe is, for human nature, it's easier to, even though no one does any of them perfectly, but it's easier to understand the last six. Because almost any society can understand, you know, murder, lying, stealing, messing with your neighbor's wife. We could elaborate, but... And even desiring what your neighbor has you know, in an envious way is bad for you. You can almost, even many pagan, without God's um, discovery, can understand that. That's a little easier to understand. Although, as, as I say, we need to understand it better, but it's easier to understand. What is harder for people is the, the top four commandments. For instance, take the commandment, about statues and pictures. Human nature, people want something to look at. Remember when we, get, we moved to Cape, one of our very good neighbors, and really wonderful people, you'd love them, they brought over a little picture of Jesus Christ, it had a light on it, you plug it in, and you put it over your mantle, I guess they did at their house. So when, you, when anybody walks in the house, they see this lighted picture of what people thought Christ looked like in the Middle Ages. It's not, obviously, there are no paintings of Christ and that, you know. But God says no pictures or statues. I know they like statues of religious figures and medallions of statues. And people, or they put them on their dashboard. People love that sort of thing. But God says not to do it. Most people can't understand, well, why not? But it, it limits God. God is greater than photos and statues. And who knows who's behind some of those photos and statues, especially the one that came out of the dark ages of Europe, but maybe that could be debated. Or oh, here's the one that people really have a hard time understanding. The Sabbath. I mean, average human nature would say, well, okay, God wants us to give him some of our time. One day out of seven isn't bad. And by the way, the French, the French Revolution tried to change the weekly cycle to one out of ten. It didn't work. There's something natural about one out of seven. But they say, but what difference does it make which day we choose? I mean, I'm looking at it from human nature point of view. And that's the one they debate the hard, hardest. What difference does it make? If we pick the day that the pagans built the sun god around over the, the Sabbath that was made holy on the creation day, the sixth day, what difference does it make? Well, see, the problem is only God can make time holy. And that's a tricky thing. People can debate that. And we can't feel it or see it, but it's really true. You cannot make any other day holy, and it makes a difference to God, and it's a sign of the, of the true God. And once you stop messing with the pagan symbols, you, you're, you're not clearly seeing the right God. But admittedly, Humanly speaking, it's hard to see the difference. It's hard to see it. Um, people say, what difference does it make? Let's go to Matthew 5. Uh, we won't spend a lot of time in Matthew 5. You could, you could do, a, obviously, you know, a whole bunch of sermons on Matthew 5. We won't spend a lot of time on Matthew 5. But I want to just make a point here. Matthew 5, as I say, the sermonette was a good introduction, helped us uh, things that I don't need to add because they were said already. Matthew 5, verse 17. Think not that I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy but to fulfill. Now, 
Many people in the world, when they read that scripture, they say, well, Christ fulfilled the law, now it's done away. In other words, they actually take his meaning and they flip it upside down. Uh, and as I read the rest of that, you see if, if Christ was saying the law is done away. But that's how many people want to interpret it. And really, the only law that they really are concerned about, well, some of them are concerned about statues and pictures, but mostly it's the Sabbath. They don't really mind the others because it's hard to, to mind the others. I mean, who wants more stealing and lying? So um, it's usually the statues and the Sabbath that they want to fight about. <clears throat> okay, an annual Sabbath. Verse 18, now see if you get out of this the idea that Christ came to fulfill the law, meaning it's now done away. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth shall pass, not one jot or tittle. These are crossing of a T or dotting of an I in, in the English equivalent. One jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the written law till all be fulfilled. Now, I'm looking outside and I see the earth out there, and it's a beautiful day, gorgeous day. I see the earth out there. So, um, verse 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of the least of these shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever shall do and teach them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Um, <clears throat> now, we haven't seen the earth and the heaven pass away. They're still there. And, and I want to emphasize the word do and teach. She'll be called great. So if you want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven, you have to do and teach the written law. And I mean, that's just basic clear English. Um, he didn't say that to do away with the law. It may well be that Christ gave a great, perfect example of fulfilling it, but it's an example we should try and follow, not as an excuse so we can do whatever we want. Um, and I understand the world sees it as they want to. I'm just going to touch on a little bit of this famous uh, sermon that Christ gave. But what I believe he's doing is he's telling you to push our obedience level to a higher level, a higher level of understanding and obedience to God's law. Um, as uh, Mr. Edwards said, get the law in our heart. Keep it with your whole heart with a kind of enthusiasm. And, you know, if, if a teacher said, I want you to practice uh, this martial art with your whole heart so you love it and you only do what they force you to do, well, that's not, that's not what he means. Now, most people would understand that. So let's look at verse 21 and 22. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, you shall not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, meaning you condemn him, is in danger of the council. Whosoever say you fool shall be in danger of hell fire. That's a fire that burns you up. What, what Christ is saying is you're told not to kill, not to murder. Christ says, I don't want you to even get close to murdering. Don't even think about it. In other words, when, you, when excuses to hate someone come up, you're to resist them. In other words, you have to hate somebody before you're going to murder them. Christ says, don't even go that far. Actually, if you look at the last parts of this chapter, I'm going to go on to um, verse 46. For if you love them, which, um, <clears throat> I'll start in verse 43. You've heard, and it has been said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And then he goes on to say, you know, if you're only nice to the people that are nice to you, don't the gangsters and criminals and tax collectors do that? Think of what a fabulous world will be in the world tomorrow when everybody gets God's spirit poured out on them, everybody is converted, and when people have problems with their neighbor, they'll remember these words, you're supposed to love your neighbor. Because there's always rivalries, and I don't like his personality, he doesn't like my personality, we're rivals for the same girl, or, or whatever people are rivals for. 
you learn to love your rivals instead of hate them. In this world, of course, it's hate and kill and war and fighting and stabbing each other in the back, you know, that kind of stuff. Think of what a fabulous world it will be when people are pushed to move toward the higher level. Not only do you not kill your enemy, you don't even hate them, and even if they do or say something that's provocative, you love them anyway. Now, we're, now self-defense is another story that we mentioned before. He doesn't mean you can't defend yourself. He's just saying how to reach that higher level of love. Let's go to, um, <clears throat> he says the same thing about running off with your neighbor's wife. If you read verse 27, you shouldn't even be thinking about her in that way. Let's go to verse 31 and 32. Uh, <clears throat> it has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife let him give her a writing of divorcement. But Christ says, but I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, except for fornication, causes her to commit adultery. Whosoever shall marry her that is divorced commits adultery. What Christ is really saying is, the higher level law toward marriage is marriage should be forever. And you shouldn't have divorce. Now, <clears throat> you're going to say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. What about there were laws of divorce? I'm not going to read it, but if you go to Matthew 19.8, uh, they ask Christ some tough questions about divorce. He basically says, God, which actually meant Jesus Christ because he was the one who gave it, but he says, God uh, gave you these laws of divorce because of the hardness of your heart. In other words, what he was saying is, back when Israel was a theocracy, knowing the hardness of people's heart, if God hadn't had certain written rules for divorce, it actually would have been bad for women. It may be bad for society as a whole because uh, you had to have certain reasons for divorce and then you had to take care of the divorced uh, spouse, I mean, as far as their food and other needs. And, and it was, there were some rules for how to do it. And then Paul talks about it in 1 Corinthians 7. In other words, because people come out of a carnal, hard-hearted background, the half the divorce exists. But that is not what God intended. The higher level for marriage is no divorce. You're, you, you stay committed. That's the higher level. And probably, I'm just going to say this as speculation, as divorce rates get higher and higher and higher. I was talking to a man. We were both sharing our army experience. He says, he married a, a German bride. He thought it was a wonderful thing. She got here to America, got her American citizenship, and by his version of things. After two kids, she stabbed him in the back. Now she has her American citizenship and left him. Um, and the truth is, divorce rates, no matter who you marry, in this country will be getting higher and higher and higher. Isn't that an indication of society's decay and people becoming more self-centered and carnal? And other bad influence, a lot of bad influences, like society is geared to undermine family values. But that's not what God wants. It's just the way the trend is going to go until Christ gets back because the hardness of our heart so, what I'm saying is human nature does not understand the higher levels of love that God has, that Christ has, or the purpose of the law. And without the Holy Spirit, people just cannot, will always go astray. And so one of the points I want to make is, um, and as we, we already read Matthew 11, but the one point I want to make is, why was Judaism a yoke on the people? Because without the Holy Spirit, even if they meant well, they were unable to do what they should have done, even though they meant well. If you go through the book of Romans 9, 10, 11, Paul says they, talking about his people, the Jewish people, had a zeal for God, but without knowledge. In other words, they wanted to be religious, but they just couldn't quite do it spiritually and correctly and right. And because of those things, there are some Bible scriptures, like in the book of Galatians, that are easily misunderstood. If you approach Galatians from, let's say, the perspective of most people today, you've got to remember you're reading somebody else's mail. He was writing to the Galatians um, and their circumstance. And the Jewish people were under a burdensome yoke. Um, 
and they'd even gotten inside of their system some pagan superstitions and worse. Um, but I want to make a, tell you a corny joke to kind of make a point. And it's not an original joke, but I like it anyway. This yuppie in New York decides he wants to stop being a yuppie and live in all the yuppie ways. He says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell my overpriced house in New York buy a ranch in Wyoming, get back to nature, and I'll be a cattle rancher, a cowboy, like in the movies. So he gets out west and buys a ranch, and then um, a visitor visits him a couple months later. He says, hey, tell me, what did you name your ranch? You told me you were going to name it the Lazy J. He says, yeah, I wanted to name it the Lazy J. My wife wanted to name it the Lucky Susie Q. My daughter wanted Bieber Fever Ranch. She's a big Bieber fan. And my son loves video games. He wants to call it the Call of Duty Xbox Ranch. And the guy says, well, where are all the cattle? And the yuppie says, oh, them. Uh, well, um, you know, we decide to call the ranch the Suzy Q, Justin Bieber Fever Ranch, the Call of Duty X Ranch, the Lazy Bar J Ranch. The cattle didn't survive the branding. <laughs> well, the point I want to make out of that corny joke is sometimes you, you get so many little details in there and you get off track. You forget the whole purpose of being a cattle rancher. Well, I believe that's what happened to Judaism when they came back from Babylon. They came back from Babylon and they said, well, we don't want to go back into Sabbath breaking and idolatry. Um, and the scribes and Pharisees who were in charge, they, I think they originally started to put extra laws around the laws so nobody could get close to breaking them. And they developed a whole system of traditions. And, and as Paul said, it's a zeal for God. There's nothing wrong with trying to do the right thing. It's just that they burden the people. Just, just one my, small story. You probably know this from John, but it's in other places. Christ was at a synagogue. And he saw this guy with a total crippled hand. By the way, in those days, you didn't have disability payments. If you had a crippled hand, you were at a real life's disadvantage. I mean, a real life's disadvantage. You know, the one such thing as handicap this and handicap door. You were at a real disadvantage in life. Uh, so just before Christ healed the guy, he knew that the Pharisees had a whole bunch of rules. You couldn't do any healing of, or medical things on people on the Sabbath. Christ looked around at the Pharisees and he said, I know in, in your laws you have a rule that if one of your animals like falls in a pit like a sheep on the Sabbath, you can reach in and rescue it. Because you realize sheep and cattle are money. They're probably worth several hundred dollars minimum if not more. So you can understand why they have a rule like that. He says, if you're able to help an animal, just a dumb animal on the Sabbath, and I make a human being, a son of Abraham, 100% whole on the Sabbath, what's wrong with that? And then he looked at him. And of course, they couldn't argue with him. They couldn't debate openly his logic. But as you all know, when you read the scriptures, after the meeting, the Pharisees Said, he's embarrassed us again and broken our rules and they conspired to murder Christ which is clearly against the law and, the, and he actually went out of his way to do a number of spectacular healings on the Sabbath and criticize their Sabbath rules and he did it intentionally because he could have avoided some of it at least a good deal of it my guess is what Christ was saying to them is you're making the Sabbath horrible you're making people miserable on the Sabbath. You're missing the whole point. We might go to Mark 2. I know we know this already, but it might be good to look at it one more time. Um, Mark 2. Um, <clears throat> and um, I'm just going to... Uh, he, t he gave an example of how certain exceptions the law were made for David, and there's no criticism of David. Notice God wasn't so inflexible monster the way they administered the law. They administered it in a cruel, inflexible, 
hard manner. And Christ was, in a, in a sense, openly doing things to criticize it. Then he said in verse 27, Mark 2, 27, he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man. In other words, why did God make the Sabbath? So man could get closer to God, so man could have a day of rest. It was a day to rejuvenate man and get closer to the true God. Anyway, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. In other words, he has control over that too. The way the Pharisees ran things, the Sabbath wasn't a blessing to the people. The people were serving the Sabbath. You know, all kinds of rules you couldn't, if a flea was about to bite you, you couldn't squash him. You had to wait until he bit you first. Uh, they could only walk so far and actually... There's some, I went to a place in Miami where you couldn't, the way they interpret it, you can't use an electric lock and the hotel would have to leave them unlocked. You can't push the elevator button, had to have a key so the elevator goes up and down every floor, which actually makes riding the elevator on the Sabbath a lot harder than if you could just punch the button. Because they say, well, you're doing something electrical. It, it's just the way they reason it. But can you see they made the Sabbath laborious. They made it a burden. Um, and they lost the meaning of it. So a key part of the early church history is a virulent party of uh, Jewish people, according to Paul, sneaked into God's church and pretended to be converted. And they tried to undermine the New Testament church to try to pull them back into Judaism, or at least their version of it. Um, and that's why epistles like Galatians are easily misunderstood. Now I'm going to read the definition of, uh, from a historical interpreter's dictionary of the Bible, volume two, of Judaism. Uh, there's a word translated walk, halakha, in Hebrew. It means in the way. Now here's a description of how the Jews developed their traditions and things. The authoritative Jewish way of life as expressed in moral law and ritual precepts. It embraces the whole body, this is halakha, embraces the whole body of Jewish teaching, legislation, and practices that proceeded from the interpretation and reinterpretation. You know, different rabbis and different committees interpreted and reinterpreted. You know, they built up a body of, we might call it case law, on top of each other, getting further and further away from the true meaning, by the way, just like our lawyers do with the Constitution as they build case law around case law instead of the original. <clears throat> anyway interpretation and reinterpretation of laws of the Bible. Although legalistic in content, the halakwa is designed to bring all human occupation into relationship to the service of God and to establish the supremacy of the divine will as a measure of all directions and strivings of all human life. Now that's the Jewish definition of what they're doing. And it's good, and they mean well. But here's the problem they run into. At first they said, well, our interpretations and traditions are elevated to the level of the law, the written law of scripture. Then the next thing you know, their interpretations and their oral traditions are more important than the written law. Another great church has done the same thing, by the way. You start off equal, then your traditions and interpretations are more important. So you're just looking at the traditions and your interpretations and reinterpretations instead of the actual law. And Jesus said they misunderstood God's law, were actually disobedient. Let's go over a few pages to Mark 7. We're going to read Mark 7, verse um, 3 and 4. Mark 7, verse 3. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands often and eat holding the tradition of the elders. Tradition is word I want to emphasize. And when they come from the market, except they wash and they eat not, and many other things, have a bunch of other traditions as well, there be which they have received to hold as washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and tables. And of course, they criticize Christ's disciples for not doing it. They, did, they have a, you have to read about it, a ritual way of dribbling water and doing a whole bunch of stuff uh, to make themselves pure. Some of them even wore nets over the mouth so no um, gnats could get in. Uh, they, you know, they really, they had hundreds of laws and traditions. Um, but notice what Christ says about all these things. And of course, he and his disciples flagrantly violated them right in front of everybody to show you what Christ thought of them. Verse 7, 
Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So Christ says they were wrong. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through their traditions, which you have delivered, and many such like things do you. Notice there are many others that he didn't even mention here. In other words, they are contradicting the written law. They're contradicting God. Their traditions have gotten so far off. Um, they had one about uh, taking care of your parents, where Corbin, if you committed the money to the temple, which money they control. You can see why they did that. You didn't have to take care of your aged parents. By the way, before Social Security, elderly people lived off family members, mostly their own kids when they got old. So this is the way, hey, my brother's going to have to take care of you or, or some other sibling. I made a deal with the Pharisees. I don't have to do anything. And it's covered in the law. Uh, and, and Christ heavily criticized those kinds of things. If you go to Matthew 23, Christ really blisters the Pharisees. He calls them snakes in the grass. But then he, he adds one more thing. He says, you transverse sea and land to make one proselyte. And he becomes more a child of the devil than even you are. I want you to put yourself, say if you're a Pharisee and you're about age 40 and uh, you're a proselyte, to Judaism, to, to the worship of the true God, and the Pharisees talk you into getting circumcised, which in those days, without the anesthesia and modern surgery and modern drugs, is at least three days of horrible pain and swelling afterwards. And you go through all that. Think of how self-righteous you're going to be. If any other Gentile wants to get in, you got to suffer as much as I did. Some fraternities do that too. You get beat up to get in, and so you want to beat everybody up before they get in. But think of how self-righteous that Gentile will be. That's what Christ was saying. And, and these things will help us understand the book of Galatians better. Um, Halakha, the traditions of the fathers, that's what Paul used to do, and he mentions that in Galatians 1.14. That's what Paul came out of. Let's go to Galatians 6. I want to show you the theme of the book of Galatians. Because when you're reading it, if you don't think of the theme of it, you only look at it from, from the human perspective in the modern world, where people are not, don't have a circumcision party, you can easily misunderstand it. Galatians 6, verse 12. Now this is the theme of the book of Galatians. And as many as desire, he's talking about the secret circumcision party, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, if they, they want to be in with all the other Jews, and they know they got to only hang out with people that are circumcised. So they're going to pressure you to get circumcised. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. In other words, even though they make a big tour about we're the most righteous law-abiding people, they actually aren't. And there's more than one place where that is said of the, of the uh, circumcision people. Even though they made a big two of the law, they don't actually keep it. For they themselves who are circumcised, uh, <clears throat> for neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law, but desire to have you circumcised that they may glory in your flesh. Yeah, I got old Bob to cut off. Anyway, that's, what, that's the theme of the book the circumcision party, which was secretive. So they didn't tell people that they were circumcision party. They just did it secretly. And they didn't even obey the law. Yet they taught that you must um, gain your justification by works of the law. Not by the blood of Jesus Christ, but by works of the law. And they resisted the justification message. If you go to Galatians 2, 11 through 14, you'll see that Peter and the other apostles, except for Paul, and the other Jews were pressured. We call it group pressure. They were pressured to stop eating with the uncircumcised Gentiles and their families because the way the Jews looked at it, it was against their laws, traditions, and rules to eat with uncircumcised Gentiles. By the way, that is not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. It really isn't. 
that they couldn't eat with uncircumcised Gentiles. Um, you might, they may have misunderstood a few things, but it really isn't. Um, let's go to Galatians 2, see it a little more clearly, but it's not in the Bible, but it's in their traditions, and Peter and the others got caught up in it. Um, and here's what Paul said, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, certainly the Jews were better off than the pagan Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ. Even we believe in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, for by works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. In other words, we don't use this justification as a reason to break God's law because the definition of sin is the transgression of God's law. And that's what Paul is saying. Galatians 3.21. He again emphasizes that, but when people go over this book, they often forget this verse and 3.21. Is the law then against the promises of God? Because some people say, well, we're saved by God's promises and grace. And Paul says, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid! For there had been a law given which could have given life, early righteousness should have been by the law. Notice the law is a good thing. Um, and what the Jewish sect got into was some of the principles of Gnosticism. And Gnosticism was a blend of asceticism, which says that anything physical is bad. Touch not, taste not. We just take a quick look at it. We'll go to Colossians 3.20, where Paul goes into some of the things that people um, said about it. Colossians chapter 2, verse 20. Colossians 2.20. I might have said 3, I meant to say 2.20. Um, <clears throat> Well, let's pick it up in verse 21. He's talking about worldly stuff. Verse 21, touch not, taste not, handle not. These are worldly traditions that some of them got into the circumcision party, which all are to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men, which things have indeed a show of wisdom and will worship and humility and neglecting of the body, not any honor to the satisfying of the flesh. I want to think about the word will worship. Can you see that what the Pharisees did and pagan asceticism kind of meet together and will worship? And you get self-righteous and you start uh, will worship. It's spiritual vanity. Um, and it's not a good thing. And you can see some asceticism slipped in as they messed over some churches and those churches uh, later got into Christianity and things like celibacy. That's from asceticism. So when the Galatians, if you go to uh, Galatians 4, 8 through 10, you can see the obvious misunderstandings that we get into. Galatians 4, 8 through 10, I means how be it then when you, know, <clears throat> when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. But now after you have known God, or rather have been known of God, Turn again to the weak and beggarly elements, and you desire again to be in bondage. You observe days and seasons and months. Well, the Corinthians, I mean, the Galatians knew that that had nothing to do with the Sabbath because they were keeping the Sabbath. Paul came to them and taught them about the Sabbath. They also knew from, we know from 1 Corinthians 5, those Gentile churches kept the holy days because that has to do with Passover and days of unleavened bread. Paul is not contradicting himself. So they knew he didn't mean uh, the Sabbath and the Holy Days. Uh, I think they understood that he meant that the circumcision party was pushing people to dangerously slide into Judaism with a little touch of Gnosticism and a bunch of pagan things. In Galatians 5, 4, Paul was so mad at him, he says, I hope the knife slips. Well, you know what that means. So he was very upset with them. You cannot earn your salvation by yourself you must have the grace of Christ. But you still should strive toward the higher love. And the new covenant, Hebrews 8 through 10, is all about putting God in your heart. And it talks about liberty in the book of Galatians. But liberty is so you can 
obey the law at a higher, freer level, not the yoke of bondage that the Gentiles did. Even American liberty, as um, Adam said, works best with a moral people. And that's really what he's saying. And you go to Galatians 5, 22 and 23, and he shows all those positive spiritual things. He says, and against such no law exists. What he's saying is, once you're moving at a higher spiritual level, you know, we're even close to breaking the commandments. And that's what we should be striving for. Remember, law and grace go together. Strive for a higher level of law keeping. Human nature cannot fully grasp it, what God wants, but God does not contradict himself through the book of Galatians. Thank you.